Our Father, we thank you for these words in Isaiah. We thank you that we are those waiting for that day when he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun at the trumpet call. But Lord, as we wait, show us how to live, how to keep going, how to endure. Amen. Well, it's quite the ending, isn't it? We've been uh, in and out of Isaiah over the last year and a half. That last verse, you kind of think, can you have just finished a verse earlier? Ended on a bit of a high. Except, it's not an isolated verse, that last verse. Throughout Isaiah, judgment has been a major theme. It was there in chapter 1, if you can think back, about a year and a half. There's whole sections of the book that focus on God's judgment. And then here, right at the end. But actually, in this way that we see throughout this chapter, judgment weaved with the Christian hope. It actually reminds us that the two are closely bound. Perhaps like two sides of a coin. But a coin, in case you couldn't remember what one looked like. (laughs) This coin is like the second coming of Christ. On one side, the day of judgment. But then on the other, the day of vindication. The day of glory. The day of resurrection bodies. And the day of ushering in the new heavens and the new earth. And last week we focused on this side of the coin. The judgment, the warning that some of us desperately, urgently need to hear. The punishment that God says will come to all who stubbornly and persistently reject his ways. And turn down his mercy that he offers us in Jesus Christ. If you weren't here last week, do go back and listen to our sermon podcast. It is an important message of warning. But today we're going to flip the coin over and we're going to focus on the other side of the coin, still thinking about living in light of the coming, the second coming of Christ. But today it's a message more for the faithful. Not so much of warning, but of hope. Now the reason we're doing that is on is in verse 5, if you have a look down. God says, Hear the word of the Lord, who? You who tremble at his words. In other words, you who are sensitive to the seriousness and awesomeness of what we have in these Bibles that we hold in our hands. And it's a message that I hope is going to help us to keep going. It occurred to me that in a, in a very, very small way, waiting for Jesus for his second coming is a bit like waiting for a bus. You know, you go to the bus stop and you know the bus is going to come. It always comes. Eventually, but you know, you wait and the minutes tick on and tick on and tick on. After a while, you start to doubt. Is it worth the waiting? Will the bus come? Or should I call a taxi or maybe go get a train? Or even better, send my apologies and go home, get back into bed and watch them. Maybe a Star Wars film on Disney Plus or something like that. Well, today God gives us a glimpse of his long-term plan. And in a phrase, it's that he's building his kingdom. And it's going to help us to keep calm and carry on. But maybe, just a word, if you're here and you're thinking, oh, well, I'm not yet a follower of Jesus, this isn't for me. Do please keep on listening. Uh, I hope that as you hear what God is doing, that perhaps it will excite you and you'll want to be part of it as well. So we're going to have three sections this morning, three encouragements. The first is keep humbly listening. Isaiah is drawing together lots of themes as he concludes his vast book. In a number of ways, these opening verses could have been spoken in lots of different ways. Context. They could be spoken towards the beginning of the book, to those people before they went into exile, before Babylon came and captured uh, Jerusalem and took them away. It could have been, though, looking forward to after they return and up until Jesus' day. 
or even I think today, our day. It's a condemnation that we see of outward religion, a bit like what we saw last week. Doing God things, but in an empty, cold way. If you ever look down at verse 3, there are all these kind of couplets of permissible Jewish worship, but then how they're seen in God's eyes, impermissible, pagan worship, just like that. Have a look down, verse 3. But whoever sacrifices a bull is like one who kills a man. And whoever offers a lamb like one who breaks a dog's neck. Whoever makes a grain offering is like one who presents pig's blood. And whoever burns memorial incense like one who worships an idol. They have chosen their own ways and their souls delight in their abominations. I wonder what it would be today. Those who sing amazing grace like ones who strangle a cat. Perhaps. <laughs> the issue though is one of responsiveness. Verse four quotes a verse we had last week. God called, no one answered. He spoke, no one listened. Instead, they just got on doing what they wanted, whatever they thought was best. It's almost Christmas. You can imagine two cousins, Tom and Fred. And Fred sends Tom and his family a nice box of chocolate-covered nuts. And, you know, it's a nice thought. Except that Tom's kids are seriously allergic to nuts. So, you know, Tom calls up Fred and he says, thanks for the present, but you, you might not know the kids are allergic, so you know, perhaps not next time. But then next year, a present arrives from Uncle Fred and the kids are excited and they open it up, but quickly Tom snatches it away because, again, chocolate covered nuts. So, you know, he phones up again. Fred, you might have forgotten. The kids, they're really allergic. Well, then next Christmas, again, the same present, and this time it's a strongly worded email. Then the next year, the same, the next year, the same, the next year, the same. And you kind of start to question the motives in the presents. And eventually it's Tom turning up on Fred's door, fuming. What are you doing? God had warned these people again and again. He told them what was good. But they didn't want to listen. They wanted to do what they thought was good. Because all that God actually wanted is at the beginning or in the middle of verse 2. It's there, the second paragraph of our reading. This is the one I esteem. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my words. Humility, contrition. The word uh, contrite in Old English and in the Hebrew as well, it, it literally meant crushed. Those who were crushed in their guilt before the Lord. And those who tremble at his words, that's not cowering behind the closest sofa, but it's like the fear of the Lord. Awe at his word. Deep respect. And wanting to listen and not think that we know better. Taking it in. That's what God wants. That's worship that is sweet and pleasing to him. But they were not humble, they were arrogant. They did not feel their guilt deeply or tremble before his words. In fact, verse 5, they mock those who do. I don't quite know what this uh, taunt means in verse 5. Let the Lord be glorified that we may see your joy. Oh, you're always going on about joy. Or when the Lord comes, you're not going to be joyful then. Maybe, something like that. Given all that's going on at the moment in the Church of England, I can't read these verses without thinking of a significant chunk of our denomination. Other vicars and curates, even bishops, you don't want people like me around or people like Andy. Churches like ours who scoff at our interpretation of the Bible, even though we're reading it, having read it for 3,000 years, who look down on us and exclude us. Yet, God's verdict at the end of verse 5, yet they will be put to shame. And verse 6, they will get what they deserve. So, 
you who do tremble at God's word. <coughs> Keep going. You're on the right track. Keep humbly listening, despite how kind of ha- seemingly happy or successful or prosperous people out there might be doing. You know, I was uh, preparing this uh, a little bit of this sitting on a train. Look at the busy carriage. You know, people just look so kind of like they're doing well in life. You don't know anything about them. But it's worth our distinct life choices, the sacrifices, the giving, the different morality, the priorities of Christianity. Are they worth it? Absolutely. Because God esteems the humble tremblers. So, as we await Jesus' return, let's keep on going. And I think part of this is, this listening to God, is quite simply coming to church each Sunday. Despite what everyone else's priorities might be, wanting to hear God's words, first and foremost. You know, the living God speaks to us when this Bible is read, when it's preached on a Sunday. And I suspect some of us can sometimes be a bit like sermon connoisseurs, you know, sitting back, listening, rating the service, critiquing what they, what they hear. You know, it was a good one this week. I was a little bit long, a bit boring. That's not trembling at God's words. That's not all. Let's keep on being those who with humility expect to hear the voice of God. So that's the first thing, living in light of Jesus' return, our first encouragement. The second is this, keep rejoicing. Now we mentioned verse 6 in passing, this city, this temple that is judged. I think there were probably echoes here of when Babylon came into the city and, and took them over. But given this is kind of looking forward to the exiles returning, I think that this might be looking forward to AD 70 and that time in history when Rome came in and sacked Jerusalem, tore down the temple completely and the Pharisees, the kind of religious, um, outwardly religious ones, they were repaid for their arrogance. And I mention that because I think it helps us put the next verses on the timeline of history. So have a look down, verse 7. Before she goes into labour, he's talking about Jerusalem, she gives birth. Before the pains come upon her, she delivers a son. It's a birth of a son and without pain. You know, no peppermint, or tens machines or epidurals needed. The reverse of the curse of Eden. And it's, it's miraculous in other words. You kind of think miraculous and the birth of a son and it's almost Christmas and the Christmas bells start ringing. Except, no, for once, it's not Jesus. Or not, at least not only Jesus. Let's continue and see. Verse 8. Who has ever seen, heard of such a thing? Who has ever seen such things as some miracle? Can a country be born in a day, or a nation be brought forth in a moment? Yet no sooner is Zion in labour than she gives birth to her children. It's the birth of a country, a nation, a people of God. And the emphasis is on, on speed, it's sudden. And it's talking, I think, about the church. In the future, there'll be a kind of culmination of these promises. But we can look back to around about the time when Jerusalem was destroyed, and as well as judgment, she was giving birth. Not just to a few, but to many. You know, this is the 5,000 saved on that first Pentecost. That was, this is the gospel advancing quickly through the nations. This was the Roman Empire becoming a Christian empire. This was every mini and major revival since the Reformation. John Wesley and his friends in the 18th century. Um, Billy Cray, Graham, his crusades. That's just a few small examples in this country. But even just this church You know, every generation is only a few decades away from the church dying out if it were not for 
the miraculous work of God to birth out a new generation of believers. That's what he's been doing for 2,000 years. Each generation, a new generation. He keeps it going and he's doing it now and he'll do it again. And so even though 2,000 years ago Jerusalem was destroyed, we can look forward and rejoice with the new Jerusalem. As we look forward into the future, verse 10, rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad for her. All you who love her, rejoice greatly with her. All you who mourn over her, for you will nurse and be satisfied at her comforting breasts. You will drink deeply and delight in her overflowing abundance. There's hope for the new Jerusalem, for the city of the people of God. Hope of being satisfied and comforted and of abundance. And then verse 12, of peace that's like a river and the wealth of the nations like a flooding stream. I love the thought of all the riches of all the diverse cultures of the world flooding into this kind of world city of God. And then verse 14, when you see this, your heart will rejoice. It's a wonderful picture. It's a wonderful encouragement. And so, as we wait, keep rejoicing at this. I think it's times for the times when kind of another niggling doubt can pop into our minds. But this time, this one, you know, a long time has passed. Is the bus coming? Are we on the right track? Have we made the right choice with Christianity? Well, as we look back over 2,000 years to the single most important moment of human history, the birth of a church which completely changed the world, despite the powerful people who have tried and still tried to stop its growth. It spreads. It is spreading, just as God predicted. I'm reading an Advent devotional at the moment and yesterday, kind of working through the Christmas story, yesterday it was all about the certainty. You know, picking up on the names that Luke includes. Caesar Augustus, he was a real person. Quirinius, a real governor of a real place. Luke, he investigated, he talked to people like Mary perhaps. And that's just about the Christmas story that we can be sure. But the whole thing, we can have certainty it's history. Do you know how the uh, Greek god Athena apparently came about? Fully clothed out of Zeus's head. It's not even trying to be history. But here we have actual history. And we can look back over all that God has done for the last 2,000 years and have confidence to rejoice. So, two things. Thirdly, and finally, keep sharing as we look forward to the return of Christ. Because despite what we've already seen, we might still look around at our country and wonder, what is God doing? What's his plan? Is this really his plan? And so God tells us his plan. He tells us what he wants to do in this great period of history between Jesus' first coming and his second. It's there in summary in verse 18. He will gather all nations and tongues and they will come and see my glory. What's he doing? He's building his church. This international vision of people seeing God and believing and following and worshipping in their own languages. And then in verse 19, he then tells us how he is going to do it. I will set a sign among them, and I will send some to those who, or, or those who survive to the nations, to Tarshish, that's in Spain, to the Libyans, that's North Africa, to the, and the Lydians, famous as archers. I told my daughter Lydia that those who came from Lydia in modern-day Turkey are famous as archers. She got very excited. She wanted to make a bow and arrow and show it to you all. But the point is that these places, they're like the, the four corners of the known world. To, you know, 
the extent of the world to Tubal and Greece and to the distant islands that have not heard of my fame or seen my glory, they will proclaim my glory among the nations. I wonder what you think the sign is at the beginning of verse 19. I will set a sign among them. Isn't it the cross? That the cross has gone out. That missionaries have taken them all over the world. I am... This is happening, isn't it? I uh, I find some pictures from around the world. Perhaps you could just kind of go through them reasonably quickly. This is Brazil. Or if I walk away, I'm not going to know where they are. Um, Next one. Ethiopia. There's a cross there. Then Thailand. Uh, Haiti. This is just after a hurricane. But the... um, Next one. There we go. Uh, But the cross still standing there. A witness, a sign. Bolivia. Of course, uh, Normandy. Kind of cemeteries in France, and then the Philippines, and this I think is my favourite, a mural, the cross in the middle. Across the world, a sign gone out, the gospel going out, people, missionaries taking it out, and coming back here. You know, lots of missionaries come to the UK, particularly from places in southern Asia and Africa, because we need the gospel, and they want to bring it to us. God is building his church. You know, no one knows how many people are actually in God's kingdom, but one in three of the world's population consider themselves a Christian. Apparently, I have no idea how anyone knows that. That's about 2.4 billion people. And yet there are still billions who have never heard. Thousands of unreached ethnic groups. And still countless people being saved every day. And then verse... 20. They will bring all your brothers and sisters from all the nations to my holy mountain in Jerusalem as an offering to the Lord. And distance won't matter. They'll come on horses, in chariots, in wagons, and on mules and camels. Whatever the terrain, they'll get there as an offering to the Lord. I don't know about you, but I think this is exciting. That this is what God is doing. That's why Jesus has not yet returned. So that the gospel can spread further. Perhaps someone here might even take the gospel out. Whether to Bookham or to another country. I get really excited, particularly about what's going on here in Leyland. Being in a privileged position of being able to see a little bit more about what's going on. People joining our, num- joining our number, or people exploring and searching and understanding and growing, of the young people growing in their faith. And then at Christmas, you know, like Light Up Leyland last week, God willing, the services over the next few weeks. People whose faces I don't recognise coming through the door. A scout service on Friday, lots of visitors coming to hear about Jesus Christ and the message of joy. God is doing stuff. He's at work. This is his plan. So let's keep on going. Keep on sharing. Keep on inviting. I mean, how offensive is it really to invite someone to a Christmas service? Or to one of the events going on in February? Now is the time to get those dates in the diary for February. To start mentioning it. You know, mention it a few times as you, you know, as you just casually, before you invite them. They're ready to say yes. Let's keep on sharing. Because God is building his church, the church of Christ. Let's keep humbly listening, keep rejoicing, keep sharing. For we're on this trajectory to verse 22. That day when the new heavens and the new earth will come. That wonderful culmination of all that God is doing in the world. The two sides of that coin. The judgments that sin and evil will be done away with for good. But the other side as well, that the Lord will usher in a new creation that will endure forever. A Sabbath rest that will endure forever. Being with him forever. So for now, let's keep going. Let's pray to him.
Lord Jesus, thank you that you have gone away and sent your spirit, that there's this period of people coming to you. Perhaps we lift in our hearts those whom we know, whom we long to hear the gospel and believe. Lord, would you do that this Christmas? We lift to you those who are coming in for the services. Would people want to hear more? Would people believe? We pray for those going out to the nations, perhaps some that we can think of that we know personally. Be with them today and bless their work. And for us, give us boldness, give us excitement, give us encouragement. And help us to keep on going, keep on living for you in all that we do. For your great glory and for the glory of that final day when Jesus returns. Amen. Amen.